Well, back in September of this past year, we began to make our way as a church through the Apostle Paul's letter to the church located in the city of Corinth. Corinth was a very significant city in the first century, as Paul is writing. Due to its location, it was a commercial center. In today's terms, Corinth is New York City. It's a financial center. As a result, it was a city of great wealth. Also due to its location, it was a political center. Other than Rome itself, Corinth is the political hub of the Roman Empire. I guess you could say it's Washington, D.C. in that area of the Roman Empire which occupied most of the world at that time. From a moral standpoint, Corinth is all about one thing. Sex. The phrase sex crazed falls short in describing the moral climate, the passion, if you will, of Corinth. In today's terms, by reputation, it's Las Vegas on steroids. So when you think of when you think of Corinth and what Paul is stepping into and what he's writing to this church in Corinth about. Think of it as a city, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Las Vegas all rolled into one. You got the idea? Into that environment, the Apostle Paul travels to bring the message of Jesus. He's going to tell the people there about the crucifixion of Jesus, about the burial of Jesus, about the resurrection of Jesus, and the implication of those events for not only their lives, but their eternities. Would you like to be in Paul's shoes? Challenging task, wouldn't you say? A challenging calling. Well, Paul shows up, and under the power of the Holy Spirit, he begins to bring the message of Jesus, and people respond. And as a result, in time, a church is established. Paul will go on to spend roughly 18 months there in Corinth, getting that church planted. He then leaves to go on in his journeys to spread the message of Jesus to other cities. And then approximately three years later, he writes a letter to this church that he had formed about five years earlier. We have this letter now in the Bible, and it is called the book of First Corinthians. Paul tells us in the book why he writes. He writes what turns out to be 16 chapters. It's a long letter. Basically, he writes for two reasons. Reason number one, he's received troubling reports of division in the church. In chapter one, verse 10 and 11, we read this. I appeal to you, brothers, and when he says brothers, he's referring to all that make up the body of Christ. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some of from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And Paul is going to spend what amounts to the first six chapters of this letter addressing all the contributing factors to their division. The second reason that Paul writes is is in an attempt to answer questions that they have posed to him. In fact, the opening line of the very next chapter, chapter 7, he writes, now for the matters you wrote about. They had apparently written Paul a letter asking questions. Understand, the church of Corinth is made up mostly of Gentiles. There were some Jews. You can read the story of the birth of the church in Acts chapter 18. There were some Jews. But mainly it was a church made up of Gentiles, meaning these were people that had no 
No, no spiritual background, if you will, with the living God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. They knew nothing about the law of God. Therefore, coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, they were, they were just infants when it came to understanding what it meant to live a life that is acceptable before God. And so they had a lot of questions. And so they asked these questions, and Paul, from chapters 7 through 16, makes an attempt to answer all of these questions. Now, just before we dive into where we're picking up the letter uh, from where we were this past fall, I want to say something to you that's extremely important that we all need to know as we begin 2024, and with all the messages that you're going to hear here at Discovery Church, what you need to know is this. While Paul is identified as the author of this letter, he is not really the author. He is the writer. He's the scribe, but he is not the author. God himself is the author. It's God's content through Paul's mind, through Paul's personality, yes, as with all the writers of the Bible, but friends, make no mistake about it, the author, the originator of the content is God himself. So that as we go through this and we, we hear about division and how do you address the factors of division, we're not getting Paul's opinion, we're getting the opinion of none other than the living God. And when it comes to all the questions that we're going to be making our way through as we hit chapter 7 and beyond, all the different issues of life. We're not getting Paul's opinion on those issues. We're not getting Paul's answers. We're getting God's answers. And so it's very important that as we, we sit under the instruction of God's word through the course of this year, and we, we will open God's word together week after week after week, it's very important we remind ourselves that while the author in this case, Paul, in some cases, Peter or John, others, friends, the author, this is the word of God that we sit under. And therefore, it comes with an authority, the ultimate authority, the only authority ultimately that counts in life. With that in mind, we finished our way through chapter 3 before the first of the year, so let's pick up at the beginning of chapter 4, follow along as I read the first five verses. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. All right, now Paul is still addressing this matter of division as he writes these words. Specifically, he's addressing one of the contributing factors to their division, which is the formation of cliques. We all know what a clique is, right? Question for you. From your life experience, does the presence of cliques in any environment lead to unity or division? We're not confused about that, are we? The formation of cliques is a source of division within any organization, and that's what's taking place in the church of Corinth. I read to you a moment earlier, verses 10 and 11 from chapter 1. Let me read to you specifically about these cliques in verse 12. Paul writes this. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul, Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas, another name for Peter. Still another says, I follow Christ. In other words, Paul, Paul says, some of you have formed the Paul clique. And then some of you are in the Apollos clique. And then some of you are in the Peter clique. And then some of you just say, I'm with Jesus. And he says, as a result of the presence of these cliques, there's, there's division in the life of the church. You see, friends, the fact of the matter is, behind the scenes, the people of the church were comparing leaders against one another. They were making judgments about the leaders. Oh, you know, I like the way this one speaks. I'm not as keen on the way that one speaks. 
Oh, I like the one that way that one leads. Oh, I, I, I like the one way this one leads. And they began to play favorites. Clicks were forming. And as we all know, clicks bring division. So Paul is going to address this head on. And that's what he does here in chapter 4. So we're going to begin to make our way through it. Now, when you read the Bible and when you study the Bible, one of the simplest outlines for, for doing that is by simply asking and answering three questions. Question one, what does it say? What is God saying? We could call that revelation. God is revealing his truth. What is the truth that God is revealing? Question two, what does it mean? In other words, the interpretation. Question three, what does it mean to me? Application. Revelation, interpretation, application. And by the way, if you were to attend our, our Discovery Pathway 201 class, this very outline, we teach you how to walk through. You know, I was made mindful just in the past couple of weeks as I was reading some books and things that, that a shepherd doesn't feed sheep. A shepherd leads people or leads sheep to where they feed themselves. Friends, my job and the teaching team here, our job is not to feed you. Our job is to lead you to where you can feed yourself. I want, you to, I want to teach you how to read this book, not just talk to you from it. Your dependence can't be on me and another teacher to feed you. Your dependence needs to be on the Holy Spirit. You have God's voice if you know Jesus. You have God's voice in you, and he can talk to you through his word. So what is, what is God saying? What does it mean? What does it mean for me? And, um, and so I'm going to use that little outline as we walk through this to give you an example of how this works, okay? And I'll begin with Revelation, and I'm going to combine it with interpretation simply for the sake of time, all right? So let's begin with the very first line again. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ. Let's just stop right there. What's the first truth that God is revealing here? What God is saying is, we leaders, us leaders, Paul, Apollos, Peter, that he's referring to, those of you in the church ought to regard us and see us as servants of Christ. That's the revelation of truth. Oh, what does that mean? What's the interpretation? Well, there are two Greek words. The Bible, New Testament's written in Greek. There are two Greek words that are translated into our word in English, servant. The word used specifically here is the lesser used word of those two. And the word used specifically is a nautical term which refers to an under rower. In those days, obviously, ships didn't have motors. So they were powered by one of two things, either sails or rowers. And when you're talking about a large vessel, like many Roman ships were, having sails was not sufficient. Obviously, there were days that were not windy. And so, therefore, if you're depending upon sails, you're not going anywhere. And so, on account of that, the ship was filled with holes where large 40-foot-plus long rows were placed in the water, and there were rowers. Well, in Roman ships, there were three levels or layers of rowers. We have a picture we can put up on the screen. Here's what the inside of a Roman ship would look like. And I think you can see the three levels of, row of uh, oars that are coming out uh, from the ship. When Paul writes here and says, so men ought to regard us as servants of Christ, the Greek word he's using refers to the lowest level of rowers, the under rowers. Paul says, as leaders, you need to see us and understand that we are servants of Christ. Who do we serve? Christ. The captain of the ship is Christ. That's who we're, if you will, rowing for. Let's continue reading on. So men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust, and you stop right there. The second truth that God is revealing is that, that servants of Christ have been entrusted with something. What have they been entrusted with? He says, with the secret things of God. In other words, the word of God. The, the people that Paul is writing to, they don't, they don't have a Bible. They don't, they don't have a New Testament. 
The only way in which they're getting the word of God is through the apostles, through Peter, through Paul, and, and now through the letter that he's writing, which was later affirmed to be the word of God. He said, I'm a servant of Christ. We are servants of Christ as leaders called to steward his word. Now, what is a steward? Well, a steward is a manager. That's distinguished from someone who is an owner. We can think of it in our, in our culture, in our way of thinking today, as, as a financial uh, investor, okay? There are many people, we have a number of them in the church, who work as investors, meaning they take the money of, of those that own the money, who give them the money to invest, and they become a steward or a manager. They don't own the funds, but they steward and manage the funds on behalf of the person who does own it. What Paul says here is, we as leaders, servants of Christ, have been given by God an entrustment, his word and his people. And our calling is to steward that which has been entrusted to us, the secret things of God, the word of God, to you, his people. And how are we to do this? Well, the last line of verse 2 must be faithful. The measuring point of success at the end of the day is do this faithfully. We have a calling upon our lives, Paul says, as leaders. Servants of Christ, that's who we are, called to steward the word of God and the people of God in a way that is characterized by faithfulness. What is, what is faithfulness? Well, faithful is defined this way. Remaining loyal to, steadfast in affection and allegiance, true to the facts, firm in adherence to promises or observance of duty. In my words, to be faithful is to be remain committed to that which God has called you to. To remain committed to that which God has called you to. So, we're only made our way through two verses, and this is the revelation, and this is the interpretation that leaders in the church are to be servants of Christ, stewarding that which God has entrusted to them, his word and his people, faithfully. Well, let's continue on, verse 3. Paul says, I care very little if I am judged by you or any human court. Now, why would he write this? Well, the reason he writes this is because the people in the church at Corinth are doing what with regard to their leaders? They're judging them. They're judging them. They're comparing them. They're setting them up against one another. And, and Paul, in interpretation terms, says, what you care of me, what you, what you think of me, what judgment you make of me is irrelevant to me. I don't care what you think of me. It's just not important to me. You're not my evaluator. You're not my boss. I am a servant of Christ. And he continues on. I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. In other words, what Paul's saying here, interpretation is, I'm careful even when it comes to evaluating myself. You know, I have found over the years, I've been involved in doing enough evaluations that people tend, all of us, tend to fall when it comes to evaluation, when it comes to personal evaluation, on one side or the other. There are, others of you, there are some of you here and listening to me who are really hard on yourself. When it comes to evaluating yourself and whatever you do in life, <laughs> you, you, you set yourself a high bar. And then there are others of you who, you're always cutting yourself some slack. You're light on your, oh, it's not that bad. I think I'm doing pretty well, da, 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 da. And we all have a tendency to fall one side or the other. Paul says, I'm careful. I don't want to fall to one side or the other with regard to evaluating myself as a servant. In fact, he then goes on in verse 4. My conscience is clear, meaning I don't know of anything I'm doing as a steward where I'm failing, not aware of it. But that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness. He will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. What Paul says is, God 
is my judge. God is our judge as leaders. He will judge us, evaluate us, give us, if you will, the end-of-life performance review as stewards of what he has entrusted to us. All right, so that's what God says. That's the interpretation of it, if you will, in these five verses. Um, uh, so, so now we move on to application. What, what does this mean for us? Like, well, what do we take from this and with regard to our application of it in life? Well, in this case, Paul's going to help us with the application in verses 6 and 7. He writes this. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what was written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? All right, now, you listen to those verses as I read them, and perhaps you respond as I responded when I first read them. What? <laughs> Anybody respond that way? You listen to that, you say, okay, Don, I hope you're going to explain that to us because I have no idea what Paul just said. Friends, that's exactly how I responded when I first read it. Oh, my goodness, i got to speak on this a week from Sunday. <laughs> so in that case, what do you do? Holy Spirit, I need to have you illuminate my understanding so that I know what it is that you're trying to say to me out of these words. You see, friends, the Word of God is not a comic book. It's not a children's book, if you will. It's the Word of God. It has depth to it. I mean depth. There are passages in the Bible that I've taught 15 times over the years, and each time I teach it a little bit differently. Why? Because the Word of God is bottomless. There's no end to the Word of God. And this is why when you read the Word, you have to say, all right, so what is God saying? What does it mean? What does it mean for me? And you have to sit with it and meditate on it, and reflect upon it, and let the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to you to illuminate your understanding. So, so obviously, that's, that's what I did. And when I did that, what I came away with is what I'm going to just call a threefold application of what God is saying. I label it as three layers. I believe there are three layers to what God is saying here to us with regard to application. Layers one and two are direct messages that God is saying to us with regard to application. Layer three is that which I would refer to as implied application based on what we read here, right? So let's uh, dive into the application part of this. Layer one, a word to leaders, a word to leaders, a word to leaders in the church. God is speaking directly to people like me, those on the teaching team here, to our entire staff, to our elders, but not just to us. If you're a small group leader, God is talking to you. If you're a leader in our student ministry and you've got some students that are under your spiritual influence with regard to the word and their lives and, and grow spiritually, God's speaking to you. If you're a worker in the children's ministry, whether they're four-year-olds or fourth graders, whatever they are, if you've got a group of children sitting around you and you've been entrusted by God with the responsibility of those children and his word to those children, God is speaking to you. If you're a man leading a small group or in our men's ministry at the men's breakfast, you're a table lead, God is speaking to you. If you're a woman and you're leading a Bible study of some kind, there, there are hundreds of leaders in the life of Discovery Church across all of our campuses. As a leader, God is speaking to you in these words. And what is he saying to you? You're a servant of Christ. What does that mean? You're an under rower. You're an under rower. Why is this significant? Well, significant for this reason. If you were to take our staff, all right, our paid staff here at Discovery, which numbers nearly 100 people full and part-time, 
We have an organization chart. You probably have an org chart at your respective workplace. Kind of tells, you know, who's an authority here and who reports to who and all that. Well, we have the same thing, okay? And, um, and if you were to look at our org chart, you would see my name right at the top because I'm a lead pastor, right? And so, in a sense, the organization, you know, re reports to me. Now, for organizational purposes, that's important to understand so that the people in the organization say, well, you know, who, who's, who's, who's ultimately over the organization here? Oh, I see it, Tim. But friends, for me personally, you know what I need to see when I look at the chart? I'm a servant of Christ, meaning I'm at the bottom. Why is it important? Because in terms of my identity in my own eyes, and in light of my ego and my own pride and my need to walk in humility, I need not see myself there. I need to see myself there. And this is true of every leader. Can you imagine how different our world would be if every leader in every realm who held the organizational headship saw themselves as an under rower? Would that change our world at all? Would like that change government? Would that change corporations? Would that change educational institutions? If the people at the top of the organizational chart saw themselves as an under rower. Well, friends in the church, leaders are under rowers. Servants of Christ. And friends, whether you lead five people 15 people or 50 people or 500 people or 5,000 people. All of those roles, regardless of size, matter the same. In the eyes of God, God sees someone leading 5,000 no differently than he sees someone leading five. Because God calls leaders, servants of Christ, to be faithful stewards with whatever that's been entrusted to them. And to understand the significance of the stewardship, you just need to know this. Of everything that is on planet Earth today, everything, everything that fills planet Earth today, there are only two things passing on to eternity. Just two. The souls of men and women and the Word of God. That's all, friends. Everything else stays here. The souls of men and women will go on into eternity. The word of God will go on into eternity. And so therefore, if you've been given the calling by God to steward his word and his people, you have a calling that is not only significant in this life, but for all of eternity. And if you're in a children's ministry and you understand that, you see those four-year-olds differently. And if you're in a student ministry, you see those teenagers differently. And if I understand that, I see you differently. And I do understand it. And it's an awesome calling. It's an awesome responsibility and it's an awesome privilege because with every responsibility comes privilege and with every privilege comes responsibility. So that's application number one. Layer number two, a word to followers. A word to followers. I'm going to read verses six and seven again. Now, brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? So I'm talking now, layer two, a word to followers, to everyone who's under a leader. So if you're a member of a small group, you're under a leader. If you're serving on a team somewhere in the life of the church, and that team has a leader, of which they all do, you're a follower. In fact, everyone listening to me right now across all three of our campuses and online, this applies to you because you're a follower. You're a follower, okay? Well, you need to know this as a follower. You are fair and accurate in seeing me and in seeing any leader in your life 
as a servant of Christ. You're fair and accurate to see them that way. However, you are not fair or accurate to see yourself as their master. They don't work for you. I don't work for you. You say, well, Don, that's obvious. I'm a follower. I'm not their master. No, no, let me, let me explain. I spent many years, quite a few years, as a, what you could call a church consultant. I would work with leadership teams in churches and in congregations and things, and I would travel, and there'd be more than a few occasions where I would sit with a group of leaders, often a group of people in a church, often looking for a lead pastor, and they would make a statement like this. Well, you know, the pastor comes here. He works for us. He answers to us. And I would listen to that, and I would uh, think to myself, okay, Don, calm down and um, (laughs) respond tactfully. Um, Can I just push back a little bit? Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, No, you're not their master. They don't serve you. They serve Christ. Would you like me to show you the verse? Friends, I don't answer to you. I don't answer to you. No leader answers to the people that they lead. Called to serve? Yes. But who we answer to ultimately is Christ. Now, is there accountability in the church? Oh, yes, there is. So if you think that I'm freewheeling, I'm not. (laughs) And Paul, God uses Paul to write very specifically and gives instructions to the church that in every church, a team of elders is to be set up. Not one individual, no one individual, but a plurality of people. We have them. There are eight. And from an organizational standpoint, with regard to my stewardship of my role in this church, I answer to the elders. And I do that believing that they are under Christ I'm under Christ, and the hope would be that if I'm stewarding my role in a way that honors Christ, and they steward their role as a way that honors Christ, then we're going to get along famously, which, by the grace of God to this day, is the case. All right, now, just before I go on to level three, I want to dig into a little deeper into the application of this for us as followers. We've been telling you throughout the course of this series from the book of 1 Corinthians that the church in Corinth had a, had a fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem was this. The culture of Corinth, the city, was having a greater influence on the culture of the church of Corinth then the church of Corinth was having on the culture of the city of Corinth. In other words, they, the, the influence was going in the wrong direction. God has positioned the church to influence the culture, not the other way around. And yet the culture in Corinth was influencing the church. Well, you know, in many cases today, this is still going on. Uh-huh, still going on. Let me give you a few examples. In the culture of the world... Almost everything is measured by numbers. Almost everything. What's the score at the end? What's the bottom line? Let me look at the dollars. What are the numbers? How many people? We want to see numbers going up and to the right, as they they say. That's the culture in the world. So what happens and can happen is we come into the church and we apply that same kind of thinking to the church. What does that look like? Well, what it looks like is, well, that must mean that the bigger the church, the better the church. The more people in the church, the more successful the church. And friends, can I just say very clearly, not true. Not true. Just because a given church attracts a large number of people does not mean that it's operating as God's desires. Numbers matter in context. Numbers matter to a degree. I notice the numbers. But friends, I'm not obsessed with numbers because at the end of the day, 
the number of people who attend Discovery Church or the amount of money in Discovery Church or how many facilities under roof we have. Friends, at the end of the day, none of that defines us in the mind and heart of God with regard to being the body of Christ. Another example, in the culture of the world, leaders are often judged by giftedness. Oh, he, is, he or she is so gifted. Or by personality. Oh, my goodness, are they a charismatic personality? I understand why people follow him or her. They're just such a charismatic personality. Again, be careful. Be careful. Just because someone is a skilled communicator, for example, or a dynamic personality does not mean that they are faithfully stewarding the Word of God. There are more than a few people who stand in pulpits like this around the country speaking to large numbers of people, and upon listening to them, I would say, eh, not sure. Not sure. Friends, the culture of the world is impressed by style. God is impressed by substance. The world's impressed with style. God's impressed with substance. Be a person of substance. One more application. Our culture, the culture of the world, everyone's a critic. Everyone's a critic. Why are we critics? We're all critics. I'm a critic, you're a critic, we're all critics. Why are we critics? Because at the heart, we're all consumers. We all like it our way. True? So we go to the restaurants we like, and the restaurants we don't like, we don't go there. We don't consume their food. We go to the events that we like. We go to the concerts we like. We go to hear the performers that we like to listen to. We go to the movies we like. We avoid the ones we don't like. We shop at the stores we like because we're consumers. We like it our way. And when it comes to the church, there's a danger. And that danger is we walk into the church and we become, once again, a consumer and therefore a critic. Well, you know, they don't sing the songs that I like. Well, you know, the coffee at that church is better than the coffee at this church. (laughs) Well, I guess that applies here. (laughs) Hopefully we've got the best coffee, otherwise somebody's head's going to roll. Okay, no. No, no. Well, you know, it's just, it's just so much easier from their parking lot to get to a seat than it is over at that church. Be careful. You see, when we walk into the church, if we're a believer in Jesus, we're not consumers, we're contributors. And we're not critics, we're encouragers. Be careful what you do with your preferences. Now, is there a place of judgment? Better word, discernment? Yes. Yes, there is. I told my children when they were in high school and as they headed off to college, I said, listen, over the course of your life, God may direct your path to different places and cities and things. And when you go there, wherever you go, and you begin to look for a church, if you attend a given church and after being at the service, you found that you never really needed your Bible... Because the message that day was really a bunch of stories from somebody's life and the pastor's life and a few other people's life. Make that the last time you ever visit that church. Because at the end of the day, I say to my kids, you don't need the stories of somebody's life. You need the stories of God. And it's interesting, this is in effect what he says at the end of verse 6 and verse 7. So for those of you who are wondering, what's he really saying here? He, he He says, then do not take pride in one man over against another, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? What he's saying is this, at the end of the day, you know that giftedness that you want to lift up? Who gives gifts? God does. I didn't pick my gifts. You don't pick your gifts. God assigns gifts. And by the way, those charismatic personalities, who gives those personalities? God does. And who causes things to grow? God does. The farmer can plant, but friends, 
Nobody since day one, it's never going to change, is ever taking that seed and making it into a plant. Only God. And when it comes to growing the church, God grows the church. So what he's saying here is, why in the world would you boast about any man? Why would you take pride in any man? They only have what they've been given by God. Well, layer three, a word to everyone, a word to everyone. There's a general revelation, if you will, from this passage. It's not said specifically, but it, it's implied, and it's implied all throughout Scripture, and, and, the, and the application is this. As God's people, we are all servants of Christ. We are all stewards of what God entrusts to us, and we are all, in the end, called to be faithful And friends, knowing that really matters. It really matters. Understanding that if you're in Jesus, understanding if you know Jesus, that you are in Christ, makes you a servant of Christ. That's your identity. If you understand your calling, that you're you're called to serve, you understand that you've been called to be faithful. That's the bar of success, faithfulness. You understand all that. It makes a world of difference in how you live life. In fact, specifically, I believe it, it answers the three, three of life's most important questions. Question one, who am I? Everybody needs to know the answer to the question, who am I? The answer, a servant of Christ. That's who I am, I'm a servant of Christ. I'm talking about identity. Identity is a big deal. Much is being made of identity in our culture today. We hear about identity politics. I'm not sure I understand what that is. I've heard it defined 15 times. But anyway, it exists. <laughs> Identity is a matter of gender. Identity is a focus in corporations and in universities. Today we're hearing a lot about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What is that all about? It's about identity. We hear people say, I identify as, I identify as, I'm proud to identify as. And then they tell us who they identify as. Identity is a big deal. Well, friends, God tells us who we are. You see, when you cross the line of faith and you enter into a relationship with Jesus, you you take all your sin and you give it to him and he gives you his righteousness. When that transition happens, God the Father places you in Christ. And when you get placed in Christ, you become a servant of Christ. That becomes your identity. I have on the side of my desk, and I've had it for years, this little card. On the very top of it, it says, who am I? I won't read you the whole card, but here's a part of what it says. I am accepted because I am God's child. I am Christ's friend. I have been justified. I am united with the Lord, and I am one in spirit with him. I have been bought with a price. I belong to God. I am a member of Christ's body. I am a saint. I have been adopted as God's child. I have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. I have been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. I am complete in Christ. I am secure because I am free forever from condemnation. I am assured that all things work together for good. I am free from any condemning charges against me. I cannot be separated from the love of God. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. I am hidden with Christ in God. I am confident that the good work that God began in me will be perfected. I am a citizen of heaven. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I I can find grace and mercy in time of need. I am a born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. Friends, that's who I am. I have it on my side of my desk because I need to be reminded often that as a child of God, one who has been forgiven of their sin and brought into relationship with Christ, that this is who I am. So important to know that. Now, you may listen to what I'm saying right now and say, "Eh, I don't identify yet as a servant of Christ. I'm not there. I identify as this. Hear me say something loudly and clearly. Whatever you identify as today, whatever you identify as today, you are welcome in the walls of Discovery Church. We don't exclude anybody. You come with whatever identity you believe is yours. Now, having said that, we may not agree, we may not believe that God agrees with your identity, but know this,
God loves you. And we love you. And our desire ultimately is that you're going to see who you are in the image of God in which you were originally created. Once you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you get a new identity. And oh boy, it's the best identity, the only identity to go through life with, and the ability to look in the mirror and to say, I know who I am because I know whose I am is a big deal. Question number two among life's most important questions, what is my calling? Answer, to steward what God has entrusted to me to steward what God has entrusted to me. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, meaning you and I aren't owners. We don't own anything. We are stewards of all that God owns. God has given me a wife, Mary Ann, to steward nearly 40 years. God has given us three children, now their spouses, now six grandchildren. We have a role to steward what God has entrusted to us. We, we have a home. We're called to steward it. We drive cars. We're called to steward them. We have a bank account. We're called to steward it. I have a job. I'm called to steward it. I have a role. I'm called to steward it. God's given me spiritual gifts. I'm called to steward it. God's given me some talents. I'm called to steward them. And all of what I just said of me is true of you. Friends, understand, you and I are not called in life to be famous. We're not called to be financially successful. We're not called to be well-educated. Now, if because you steward your life well, your talents, your gifts, your abilities, your job, you become financially successful or you become famous or you become well-educated, wonderful. All of those things are byproducts. But friends, none of them are the objective. The objective is to steward your life. Steward what God has entrusted you as a servant of Christ. That's your calling. And to know that enables you to get up in every morning and to answer the question, why am I here today? And the answer is to live my life as a steward of all that God has entrusted to my care. There's a third question. What matters in the end? What matters in the end? When all is said and done and life's tent, if you will, gets packed up, what matters? Answer, prove faithful. Prove faithful. Remain committed to stewarding what God has given you as a servant of Christ. Be faithful. Be faithful. You know, perhaps you listen to this and you say, boy, you know, all this is, it's really complicated. It's hard to do. You know, it's really not. When it comes right down to it, there are only two days in life that matter. Just two days in all of life that matter for any of us. Day one, today. Today. Friends, you can't relive yesterday. It's over. Now, you may need to recover from yesterday but the only day that you can do that is today. You can't live tomorrow today. You can prepare for tomorrow today, but you can't live tomorrow today. So what does that mean? When it comes to the past and when it comes to the future, the only thing that matters is today. Today. The second day that matters in life is that day. What is that day? That day is the day when you stand before the Lord and you give an account for your life. You see, as a servant of Christ, you have a master. And the day is going to come when you stand before him and you give an account for how you have done in stewarding what he has given you. And not just what you've done, but the motive from which you've done it. Which is why he says there that he will evaluate the motives in man's hearts and at that time each will receive his praise from God. So it's not just what we do, it's why we do it. And those who steward well are going to receive their reward when they stand on that day. 
So friends, when it comes right down to it, it's all about getting up every morning and saying, all I can control is today. I can't change yesterday. I can't live tomorrow. All I can do is today. What's my job today? To be faithful in stewarding what God has entrusted to me as a servant of Christ. And if I get up every morning and you get up every morning to do just that, to steward what God has entrusted to you faithfully, then when that day comes, you and I will be ready. Amen? Amen. Let me have you bow your head for a word of prayer. And just give you a moment to, to think. I do believe God has spoken. So what has God said to you? What are you going to do about it? Let's just take a moment. We're going to wrap up the service today by singing a song entitled, I Surrender All. It's a weighty song. It's a weighty song because you can't just sing, I surrender all, if you don't mean it. But friends, at the, at, at, at the end of the day, the bottom line, you know what this is all about? Surrendering all. Myself all that God's given me surrendered to Christ. So you're invited to jump in and sing the song along with the team at our respective campuses. But maybe in some cases best to just listen to the first verse and say, all right, am I ready to sing this? I hope you are. I hope you are. If not, to say, you know, God, I'm not quite ready to do that. Would you help me? Would you help me do that? Would you help me do that? This year, would you take me on a journey to a place where I would surrender all? Because, friends, ultimately, victory in Jesus and victory in life is found through surrender. Victory is found through surrender. Countercultural to the world. Father, thank you for your word today. may continue to live in our minds and more importantly in our lives moving forward. For our good and your glory we ask in the name of Jesus, amen.